Hello, and welcome to the Recovery Out Loud Berk Speaker Series. So glad that you all could be here with me this evening. My name is Yvonne. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I didn't need to start my video, so I apologize. There we go. Sorry, everyone. You know, I'm, not, I'm a novice at this. You'd think I'd be an expert of it by now, but um, so glad that you all are back this evening and joining us. This is the live uh, Facebook uh, out, Speaker Out Loud series. This is the last uh, speaker series that we're going to have for the month of September. Um, but the good news is we have been so delighted in seeing the response that we have gotten as a result of this uh, speaker series that um, beginning October, we're going to start somehow, some way, continuing this on some level talking about recovery. Um, because we think it's really important that we continue to um, let folks know that recovery works, that recovery is possible, that people do get well. And not only do we get well, but we get well on some different pathways. You know, I was just reading uh, at the Recovery Institute um, that there are 23 million Americans who are in long-term recovery. Half, half, 50% do not necessarily go through the traditional that we know. They don't necessarily go through treatment or they don't necessarily engage in a pathway of recovery that includes mutual aid support groups or counseling or something of that nature. But we also know that there is the other 50%, and I'm included in that 50%, who did go through the traditional uh, inpatient treatment, who went through and continues to go to meetings and when necessary, re-engage in therapy and those kind of things. And so we know that um, of these 23 million Americans, that people are finding their own pathway to wellness, what we call well variety, sobriety, recovery. And so we just really want to acknowledge, number one, that people do get well, and number two, acknowledge that there are various pathways to recovery. Um, we're hoping that uh, we'll hear from somebody who is going to be talking about smart recovery. Um, we hope that they will join us here soon. But in the meantime, I'm going to kind of talk about a couple of things that I think um, what I'm hearing about in terms of people, when I hear their stories, when I hear their passion, particularly from the group of folks that we heard from, from during the month of September, as people talked about their journey in such a personal way that um, it was personal for them, but for me at least, I was able to connect on some level with their story. I was able to resonate with, you know, when they felt alone, when they didn't quite feel right in their skin. I was able to relate to that. I was able to relate to perhaps some of the um, dysfunction within their families and, and, and how they work through dysfunction to only get to the point where now they're reignited and reunited with their families. So I related to that. I also related to some of those aspects when they talked about um, their higher power and in search of their higher power and what that looked like. Um, and so I was able to connect with, on many levels, a lot of their stories. And I, that's part and parcel what uh, keeps me thriving and striving in recovery is knowing that I don't walk this journey alone. I mean, I spent a number of years uh, feeling that um, I was the only one who was experiencing these thoughts and these feelings. And then when I ingratiated in recovery, um, what I found was that a lot of me too, a lot of people nodding their head in unison when I would share, or I would nod in unison when people shared. And so it has been just um, a joy, this journey, this pathway, um, this recovery road that I've embarked upon to see that um, I am not alone in any of my struggle, that if there's something that is overwhelming to me and I don't think that I can handle on my own, that I can go to someone else and really um, have them share their experience, strength and hope, and more importantly, lift me up as well. So that has been um, a joy. That has just been a joy for me in this recovery journey to know that um, I, am not alone and to know that anything that I go through, um, I can lean on others. I can allow people to love me and appreciate and expect, 
you know, accept me for who I am and that um, this too, whatever it is that I think that I'm going through will pass and I will be um, better for it uh, so long as I don't pick up a drink or a drug today. So I kind of want to talk with you this evening about trust God, clean house and help others. And then in that, what I'd like to do while I wait for, I'm hoping Jose will join us here soon. Um, what I'm hoping that I can do in talking about trust God, clean the house, help others, I will interject my own uh, pathway, but also then invite you that if there's any question that you have regarding um, my journey um, that you would like to know more about, please fill in the comment box on our Facebook Live. Um, and then, you know, I will respond accordingly. So I'm looking at my clock and I'm going to gauge that I will stop uh, in about, you know, 40 minutes or 45 minutes. And then I will look to see if there's any questions um, and then respond to those questions. So I'm really glad that you are all here this evening with us. Um, I'm hoping that Jose will be able to join me. And then if not, as I mentioned, I'll just kind of continue to talk here about some aha moments that I've learned across, along my journey and hope that something that I've said will resonate with you. Um, the nice thing about this before I forget is that these are being recorded. And so we're going to uh, store these uh, recordings on our Facebook Live as well as our um, Council on Chemical Abuse uh, YouTube channel. So at any given time, folks want to know more information about any pathway, they can go to that, uh, to those uh, YouTube channels and they're going to be stored right there uh, at your disposal. So that's the neat thing about this. Um, and uh, the other neat thing about this is that, again, like I said, we'll continue on some level uh, these journeys of recovery and just talking about wellness and um, the, the safest and best approaches that might be available for some people to, to find sobriety and get well. Um, and so let me just kind of talk to you a little bit about, and I mentioned this in my story earlier in the month, as it relates to um, trusting God. Um, so I grew up in a home whereby um, we believed heavily in God. We, um, I remember, as early as I can remember, I went to uh, Sunday school. Uh, would go to Bible school, would go to Bible camp during the summer months, um, and believed that um, God was someone that we looked up to, that we respected, and on some level that we feared. Um, my mother wasn't necessarily a, a, a churchgoer, if you will. She wasn't a hardcore Bible thumper, but she did um, not allow us to play with God, and by that, I mean we couldn't you know, call the Lord's name in vain. Um, there was no um, acting out church unless we were in church. We couldn't, you know, come home and mock people from the church and those kind of things. We, we knew that uh, my mother was very strict about, you know, even when it was raining, I remember times when it rained and it thundered and it lightning, um, that my mother would say to us, be quiet, God's doing his work. Or that it would rain and the sun would come out my mother would say God's um, having an issue with Satan and, and God's winning and those kind of things. And so um, I grew up knowing that there was a God, um, knowing that he was um, a mighty God um, who also could be a punishing God. Um, and so that there was a line that you walked in the way of being a good Christian that you didn't falter or if you did, that God would punish you. So that's really what I grew up to believe. And um, as I grew up and as I got older, um, I became very involved in the church. And so I would go to church every Sunday. I would get involved and I would sing in the church choir. Um, I remember we would have church plays. And so I would be invested and involved in church plays. Um, and so I knew of what I knew of God. I knew that um, praising God was part of um, living right. Okay, and and um, being well versed in, in the Bible and what the commandments meant and honoring those commandments and those kind of things. And I, as I say that, I think those things kind of helped me earlier on in my teens that I thwarted against, you know, smoking and drinking. I mean, part of that was because, yeah, I saw what was happening in my family. My family was brought with 
addiction. Um, it wasn't uncommon to see alcohol all the time. It wasn't uncommon to see um, marijuana all the time. It wasn't uncommon to see, you know, to have violence erupt all the time when there was alcohol and drugs involved. And so um, that was something that as a Christian, I was against. And so I would really try to follow the path of God and doing right and steer clear away from um, using drugs and alcohol. Uh, and I believed in prayer. I believe that God answered prayer. And, um, you know, those things were really just part of my upbringing. It just was part of my upbringing. Um, and then as I got older, and of course, you begin to um, make decisions about for yourself. And along that way, you begin to hear, you begin to see things differently in a different light um, and hear things differently in a different light. And that really came to pass when I went to college. Um, my exposure to going to church on a regular basis lessened and lessened because I was away at college. And, um, you know, that thing about, you know, when you're at college, there's a certain level of freedom that you gain. That's very, very true. And so when you are away from your normalcy, what you knew into something, a new environment, and oh, by the way, you really want to be accepted in that environment, you, you kind of um, go where, you know, that acceptance that you crave or that attention that you crave is. And so, um, you know, when I talked to him earlier in my story, earlier in the month, I, I spoke about um, not necessarily uh, wanting to get involved in drugs and alcohol. Um, and then, you know, when I got to college, that perspective kind of changed, you know, um, when it was there and I had my roommate was there and, and encouraging me to let's celebrate the birthdays, you know, I, I, as I th in retrospective, I didn't even think twice about it. I, I, I think in the back of my mind at that time, I thought it was something that while I saw it and while my commitment was to not be um, like my mother, who was an alcoholic, that that would not happen to me. And so I began to engage in those behaviors um, as somebody mentioned earlier, of choice. Uh, that was my choice to initially um, ingest that alcohol. Um, but I can tell you after drinking those two bottles of Bloom's Farm, I was off to the races. It was, um, it gave me a piece of euphoria that I had never known before. It gave me a piece, a sense of confidence that I had never known before. And it was just um, a way for me to kind of be relaxed and feel beautiful and feel accepted and um, feel as though um, I had arrived, like everything was all right with the world. So um, that really just kind of led me off to the races. And um, after that, I proceeded to drink, to feel that way all the time. Um, throughout my college years and even after. And um, I drank very, very heavily. It wasn't to drink one or two. It was to drink, to feel drunk or to get drunk, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, that relationship that I thought I had with God kind of dissipated, dissipated um, really fast and right away. And um, when I started to... Uh, experienced consequences because of my drinking. Um, I didn't necessarily attribute it to my drinking, folks. I blame God for that. Like, why would God allow those things to happen and put me through this, that, and the other thing? Um, why would he allow me to get arrested? Why would he allow people to abuse me? Why would he allow me to get in fights? Why would he allow all these other things? And I wouldn't necessarily attribute those situations and conditions to my drinking, um, I would attribute them to, I would tell myself, well, God's turned away from me, right? And um, so then became that self-reliance. Then that became that my, my perception, my picture of God then kind of changed, right? That um, he wasn't there for me, so I'm just gonna kind of do me, if you will. And so I would then proceed to kind of go off on a race of just 
doing whatever I wanted to, saying whatever I wanted to, um, living my life according to Yvonne's world, right? Yvonne's world. And as I did that, um, I began to experience more and more consequences. The other thing, what I need to say, and um, th this is something that I think is really notable, is that when you are um, embraced in the disease of addiction, um, what happens is you have the ability to build up a tolerance. And so I share that to say, you know, there was a period of time in my life whereby alcohol would allow me to achieve that drunken feeling, that out of control feeling that I had. Um, and that happened for a period of time. And then after a while, I found that I was drinking more and more and more, but not necessarily getting as drunk as I would like to. Um, and I think it was Tom S that had talked about going to a friend and just kind of saying, you know, I need something else. And um, what happens is sometimes people are introduced into your life based on your behavior and your circumstances in terms of your environment and they're, they're there. And, and I lo know them today to be those folks who um, are part of that lower, par lower power circle, right? Um, and so there was an individual um, that introduced me to cocaine and crack cocaine. And it was, again, a resurgence of feeling beyond powerful, feeling like I could do no wrong, feeling like I was indestructible and um, really engaging in being in places I had no business being, with people I had no business being around doing things I had no business doing. And I share that to say, you know, somebody told me a little bit ago, um, they talked to, I shared at another meeting and they said, um, you know, let me introduce you to Yvonne, who is a woman of grace. I, those, those words, you could not put a woman of grace in Yvonne in the same sentence when I was using, when I was actively using. Um, and it wasn't a grace for me. It was a time of, um, you know, not, of just wanting to do what I wanted to do. And um, the heck was people who got in my way. And I felt like people were purposely in my way to cause me to get set back. You know, I thought that the police officer, you have no business stopping me, whether I have an expired um, uh, registered ticket or not. Um, you had, you know, to the police officer that arrested me because I was passing bad checks. Like, I just felt like people were just out to get me. They weren't after anything good and they were out to get me. And this is how the brain works. This is when you're influenced by the disease of addiction. It's like the brain just doesn't work properly. It doesn't function properly. And you give yourself all of these excuses for the behavior. And then what also happens is the mind tells you that, well, you these people are out to get you and these relationships are not working for you. So let's reward yourself and think about this over a drink and drug and, and allow the drink and drug to pacify you long enough to say, let's come up with a solution. I, I, I can tell you today that there are many a nights and many a days that I would sit up and drink and drug. And I don't know that I've ever came up with a, with a solution that was um, good enough for me to get out of the uh, circumstances that I were what was in, and um, you know the the trust God piece just wasn't part of my life in an active disease of addiction. It just wasn't. Um, and the more I sunk into my world of self destruction, the further God got out or was away for me. I pushed them away. I know that today, but I just felt at that time. The, the more, the further away he was from helping me. Um, and so there were many a times that I really um, wanted to uh, harm myself uh, because it just, I felt it's so, so out of control and confused in my life. You know, I would have jobs and then I would lose them. I would have relationships that I would lose them. I would have, you know, the, you know, some semblance of a relationship with my family, and then I would lose that trust. And so, anytime I would um, think that there was a gain, there was three steps back, and I really felt as though it was all the outer circumstances that were uh, happening 
that was contributing to me, not necessarily my own uh, disease of addiction, but circumstances out here, people, places, and things that were just really trying to wreak havoc in my life. And, you know, I mean, in, in, in all um, exposure and honesty, I, I really blame God for all of that. And, and I, um, you know, would have just this sense of um, nobody cares about me, not even God. And so why do I care about myself, right? Um, and so that went on for several, several years. And, you know, what I know today is uh, I know that I have a loving God who's always looked out for me because there's so many times that I would um, get home safely and not remember how I got home. There were a number of times that I should have uh, been in a situation that would have either jailed me or killed me. And that didn't happen because God was working in my life, whether I knew it at that time or not. Um, so when I go to talking about trusting God today, folks, it is a 360 degree turn uh, in terms of um, that period of time where I felt God had pushed away from me. Um, what I know today is I pushed away from God. What I know today is um, my spirituality was bankrupt. Um, what I know today is um, the relationship that I have with God today is a relationship that I need to work at time and time again. There's no resting on my laurels. I can't make the assumption um, that I am in good standing with God if I haven't done the work. And I guess that's the piece that I'm really, really learning about today is that I have to do the work at every measure, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. I have to put things in place to do the work and stay that connection with God um, of my choosing. Otherwise, it is it becomes a one-way relationship. And then as we know, and we know this through human contact, right? Um, one way relationships don't work. If I am giving, 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 right? Then someone else is taking, taking, taking. That's not a relationship. We know that, right? Um, if God is taking, 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 right? Or God is giving, you know, giving me all and I'm just not giving back, then there's no relationship. So we have to um, be diligent about what our purpose is and why are we staying connected with our higher power? If it's for selfish gain, right? If it's just for, you know, dress me up and, and, and give me the bounties of my life and those kind of things, and I don't work for that, then, you know, there's not, there's no, there's no gain for that. There's no, there's no uh, reprieve behind that. And so what I learned today is that if I trust God and I do the work, positive things result. And I don't sit here to say that it's all um, roses, um, that my life is, is, is treaded with gold. Um, but I can tell you, I can tell you my worst day sober has always been better than my best day high. I can tell you that 110%. Um, because what I know is even on those days that I'm sober, that I'm not feeling that great, that maybe I'm, I'm feeling overworked or maybe um, you know I've gotten some bad news or something of that nature, that I can go to people and I can talk about that and I can pray to God and I can be okay. I can get through those. Those things are only momentary. The situations that we endure, they're for a momentary peace. And so we know that through trusting God, all things are possible. I see that I have my good friend Jose here. Hi, Jose, you unmute, unmute yourself, dear. I am so glad and delighted to see you. And um, I apologize for the for the mix up. I, I saw you were on here earlier, but I didn't know who Daniel was. And so now we know. <laughs> and I've just been holding the space for you. I'm so glad that you're here. It is so great to see you. I, folks uh, in Facebook land, uh, thank you for hanging in there with us. And thank you for uh, allowing me to talk to you a little bit about 
my trusting with God and my relationship with my higher power. But I also want to introduce you to a dear friend of mine, Jose. Jose is going to talk to us about smart recovery. Again, we're talking about different pathways to recovery. And um, Jose is a facilitator of smart recovery. And he's going to share with us about smart recovery. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the comment section. And then I can um, ask Jose at the end of our program. So Jose, good to see you. Thank you. Can you, uh, can I share some? Yes. So what I'm going to do um, is if you see the share screen there, you should yes. be able to share your screen and then I'm going to go away. I'm here behind the scenes, but I'm just going to let you shine uh, with your uh, share. Okay. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, do you see where it says screen share, share screen? Yeah. If you click on that, you should be able to share your screen. I'm going to be no. right here with you until you're able to it, do that. It gives me a disabled host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, um, let's see. You should be able to. Let me try again. Okay, try again. Now I am in. Okay, so if you wanna just click on share and then your screen should pop up um, and then you can share your screen. Yes. Yep, I have it there and I will get to it when I'm ready. But I'm glad uh, to be here. My name is Jose. Uh, I'm grateful to be clean and sober today. Let me stop sharing here. So anyway, uh, hello to everyone. My name is Jose. Uh, so I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit about my path to recovery. My path to recovery uh, started six months, uh, six years, 10 months, and what's the day? And four days ago. Uh, you know, I, uh, throughout the years, I always was suffering from a substance use disorder, you know, in, in and out of institutions, and I just got tired of it. Uh, so when I was in uh, Greater First State Prison, they started, uh, they did this new program called SMART, Self-Management and Recovery uh, Training. Uh, so it was, it was interesting to me because it, it captivated me. It's more of a cognitive type of approach uh, to recovery. So... Uh, I started going and I was more interested. And then, uh, you know, I don't know this, you know, back in the day, we was allowed to go into the uh, computer room and I was searching more into it. And I really, really enjoyed that concept because it's more cognitive uh, uh, base and it's also uh, evidence based. So anyway, uh, I kept going to the meetings and uh, as soon as I got out, I uh, I kept going making to the meeting, but there was n online, but there was nothing here in in in, in Berks County. There was only one meeting up in uh, I think it was more I missing, and it was closed only to those people from uh, the vets, the veterans in Lebanon. So anyway, uh, I started working in Berks Community Health Center, and I presented to. Uh, to the people there and they say, okay, Jose, go ahead. And we started the first uh, smart recovery uh, group there. Uh, I went and got trained and I got a facilitator uh, certificate. So, you know, ever since then, that was, that's been my path. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And, uh, and we have, uh, we have, was conducting several groups throughout Reading even at the rise throughout the week and the Spanish one too. So I did it in Spanish uh, and in English. So that was pretty cool. So I'm just gonna share with you, uh, uh, Smart Recovery has four different points. And the first one is building and maintaining motivation. You know, even, even when I was at the, uh, at a facility, I'm ready to go home, and I say, oh, I'm very motivated, you know, I'm okay, I'm going to do this right, you know, and somehow 
as soon as I leave that facility, you know, uh, that motivation start eroding uh, by my environment uh, or whatever. So through SMART, I started learning how to build and maintain my motivation. So one of the tools they have, I'm gonna share it with you guys. I have it already here. Oh, let me move this to the bottom. Oh. Uh, let me see if it's this one. Nope. And it gotta be this. Yep. So this one is basically uh, the hierarchy of values. So I determine what was valuable to me. So I'm gonna share it right to you because the guy was playing to them. Can you can you guys see this video? Yeah. A five minute video. Okay. Recovery that works. On today's show, we're going to examine a tool it? that can help anyone build yeah. and maintain their motivation yeah. to stay on track in their recovery. Yeah. And it's called okay. the Hierarchy of Values Exercise, or HOV for short. First, let's break down what's implied by the term values. People often use the term value only in the economic sense, as in what is the monetary or material worth of something, its exchange value, or the bottom line when it comes to their bank account. The term value in the context that we're applying in this smart recovery exercise isn't about money. Rather, value is defined as the relative what's important to you as an individual. Because remember, everyone is different. So let's start by listing your values in order of priority. Number one might be a very common one, which is your relationship with your partner. Number two might be being a great mother or father to your kids, or a grandmother or sister or nephew. Number three could be your physical health, which is very important. And lastly, perhaps you value your career and your professional growth. Okay, so now let's step back and take a look at your list. Something is obvious right off the bat. Your addiction is nowhere to be found on that list. Moreover, by engaging in your addiction, you're essentially putting all those things that you really truly value at risk. How? Well, alcohol and drug use and gambling and other behavioral problems hurt or in some instances destroy your relationship with your partner. In some cases, you might lose custody of your children. Addictive substances definitely adversely affect your health. And while you may be able to keep your career on track, it might be just a matter of time before your tardiness or sick days or erratic performance leads to your dismissal. Bottom line, your addiction compromises your core values. And this is an important takeaway that can help you keep your recovery on track because as you continue to pursue your core values, you'll thrive as a result as a partner, a parent, and an employee. Maybe this is your aha moment. Now, we could stop right here, but the HOV exercise also allows us to go even deeper, to closely examine some core values that people hold dear or think they hold dear. The premise being that some of those things that we think represent core values are actually just priorities imposed upon us by the outside. Imagine a young woman who fulfills the expectations of her parents and makes it a priority to become a successful lawyer. But later in life, she struggles with the realization that she hates the legal profession and would really rather pursue a childhood dream of becoming a romance novelist. Or a man who follows society's expectations and marries his childhood sweetheart. But as time goes on and his marriage fails to make him or his spouse happy, he realizes that perhaps he wasn't even attracted to her to begin with. Or perhaps he's not even attracted to women at all. You may think that these are extreme cases of disconnect, but they're really not. In fact, these various degrees of misalignments are often the root cause of people's addictions to begin with. Think about it. Some people self-medicate to deal with the pain of what's been done to them by others. Some must self-medicate to deal with the pain and guilt of what they've done in their lives. But perhaps worst of all is the pain that some people feel by what they haven't done in their lives. Those toxic thinking patterns collectively known as regret. Henry David Thoreau famously stated that the mass of men and women lead lives of quiet desperation. And the cause was misplaced values. Some of us feel a void in our lives and we attempt to fill that void with things like money, possessions, and all too often addictive substances that help us deal with the pain and anxiety caused by regret. So by going a step further, 
With the HOV tool, you can begin to really dig deep and assess what your values really are versus what you thought they were. And this takes some serious introspection and honesty because sometimes the answers might be totally different than what you always supposed that they would be. But for now, let's just keep it simple. Start with three basic questions. One, what do I want for my future? Number two, what am I currently doing to achieve that? And number three, how do I feel about what I'm currently doing? Odds are, when you were indulging in your addiction of choice, you either didn't have the time or the courage to face these questions directly. The irony being that the sooner you had faced those questions, the sooner your addiction may have been addressed to begin with. If this circular reasoning sounds familiar, it's because it is. It's a common allegory in literature and films. Quote, the truth we seek has been within us all along, if only we had the courage to look. Hey, I hope these kinds of smart recovery exercises really Right, so these uh, let me start sharing here. Anyway, so this is one of the, the first uh, 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 points of smart recovery that I always use. So you know today, uh, what is important for me is what I value is staying clean and sober because everything else, my family, uh, you know, my job, you know, my friendship, you know, my self-esteem, everything else will go down the drain if I don't value staying clean and sober. And uh, that's where I'm at today. Uh, and and a good thing about SMART too, it, uh, it encourages you to do a lot of writing, you know, and writing is like journaling. It takes a life of its own. So the more I write about it, uh, the, the more it becomes my reality. And sometimes I just write it and let it go there. So I did a lot of work in the beginning. I still do a lot of journaling uh, throughout the day, uh, you know, not throughout the week of the things that are happening in the week. But in the beginning, I did a lot of writing. And SMART requires you, especially in the beginning, uh, a lot of writing, as you could see, uh, you know, pointing out all those values and where I want my future and what I'm doing right now for that future. Uh, so I know it's a seven o'clock. So uh, another uh, point is uh, coping with the urges, you know, uh, and, and that's another reality of the disease of addiction that, you know, uh, those uh, those thoughts always come. They still come to me, uh, but they're not as aggressive, as and powerful as they used to. Uh, I always say uh, to a lot of people that it's easier for me now to stay clean than to get clean when I start using. Uh, once I start using, it's like my brain is literally hijacked. Uh, and I remember many times uh, going to that, you know, to the dealer and I'm driving and I know I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't want to go there, but it's like I'm in cruise control, you know, that I can't even eat. I, everything else will be uh, second uh, hand if I don't uh, go you. So today I value my uh, staying clean and sober because I know it is a lot easier than when I started using. So I'm gonna share with you guys another little video on that and it's called coping with, uh, coping with urges. And as you can see uh, in SMART, we do have a lot of ways uh, to get the message across. Uh, we also have a booklet that we use uh, like I said, we do a lot of writing. Uh, we use a booklet. Uh, we, we also have, you know, the talking about it, the subject, and we, we watch the videos. So it's a combination of all those things uh, that I'm here now clean and sober. So it's not a one. And... Yep, here you go. Welcome back to another episode of Tips and Tools for Recovery That Works. In these strange and uncertain times, many of us in recovery feel the added stress of worrying about a possible relapse. Well, you're not alone because stress, isolation, and boredom are known risk factors for relapse. 
Relapses can and do often happen, and they're part of recovery itself. But instead of worrying about them, you're much better off just preparing for them. And to do that, it's a good idea to take a good look at the root causes of any relapse, and that's giving in to urges. Smart Recovery has several awesome tools to help you deal with urges, including the ABC tool, the Cost-Benefit Analysis, or CBA, the DEADS tool, or the DISARM method, which we'll cover on our next episode. If you haven't watched our Tips and Tools episodes about these tools, check them out. They're right here on YouTube. Regardless of what tool you use to fight urges, in this episode, I want to step back and examine what urges are and what they aren't. They aren't rational, and we tend to give them way more power than they really deserve. Here are four common misconceptions about urges. Number one, urges are excruciating or unbearable. Are they? Nobody ever died as a result of urges, although they may have died as a result of giving in to those urges. Urges are just thought patterns. Thought patterns you create in your mind and have learned how to control. Sure, they might seem unbearable in the moment, but remember, moments pass. It's a demonstrated fact that urges auto-destruct after about 10 to 15 minutes of not acting on them. Number two, urges will compel you to use. Nope, it's not true. An urge isn't some sort of puppet master pulling your strings. We all have free will. Urges don't compel people to relapse. People relapse because they surrender to an urge. Now remember, urges can and don't make you do anything. They're just an invitation to do something. Like any other invitations, you can either accept it or decline it. If you practice refusing these invitations, you'll get really good at it. And if you want to become good at abstaining, practice abstaining, whether you want to or not. Number three, urges will not go away until you drink or use. Well, that's not true either in a general sense. I mean, sure, your urges may go away temporarily after you relapse, but we all know how this works. It will only be replaced with an even greater urge to continue drinking or using or gambling or whatever in ever-increasing amounts. Urges will and do go away after a few minutes of not acting on them, or when you distract yourself with other thoughts or work some of the smart recovery tools we mentioned. Number four, cravings and urges will drive you crazy. Like, put you in a straitjacket crazy or Hannibal Lecter crazy? Of course not. You're a rational person. Nobody can go crazy from cravings or urges. I mean, you can certainly make yourself feel crazy when you experience an urge, but feeling crazy and being crazy are totally different things. One of the great things about the Smart Recovery Tools is that they let you step back and examine your feelings about urges rationally before you form beliefs about them. And in forming better beliefs about them, you can make smarter choices and avoid the adverse consequences of giving in to those urges. And once you see urges for what they really are, irrational constructs of your mind, you can stop worrying about them as much. Hey, I hope these smart recovery tools really, really help. So that's one of the many tools uh, that we have uh, for SMART. Uh, one of my favorite tools is digging it through. And SMART, uh, you know, uh, I give an example. Is uh, they uh, we call it uh, leading uh, the lead in phrases like, you know, uh, it's Friday. Why not, right? Instead of putting a period there at the end of that phrase, put a coma, right? It's Friday. Why not? Well, because it never worked before. <laughs> you know, it just having different tools. Uh, and only one, you know, who cares? Well, coma is not a period. Wait a minute. Let me let me finish that sentence. Uh, I care because every time I did one, it was not enough, you know. So, you know, those are, are one of the many tools that uh, we have uh, the, uh, at SMART. Uh, again, we provide the book and with the book, there's a lot of homework uh, that is in the process of that. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, also SMART, uh, it's online. So we had chat rooms and uh, we have, I've been in meetings, it's pretty cool uh, with people from all over the world and probably even now uh, with uh, the other groups. But, you know, uh, in the beginning, even in the beginning, I was, I remember uh, it was a Sunday uh, morning and there were people from Canada, Australia, and I was, it was so cool uh, to have, you know, 
be there with people from different part of the world sharing smart. So it's pretty cool uh, that online uh, meetings they have. So what uh, one of the, uh, the second ones is managing the thoughts, uh, feelings and behavior. Uh, and the last one is keeping a balanced life. And, you know, uh, I hear it all the time now uh, because I do work in the field. Uh, a lot of guys is like, like Jose, you know, I'm bored now. You know what I'm going to do now? I, at least before I always had something to do, ripping and run, running out there. Now I'm bored. And one of the things uh, in SMART is just finding uh, constructive ways uh, to do, I, I I like to ride my bike. I'm an outdoorsman. Uh, I ride my bike. I uh, I meditate. I do yoga. And it's funny. Uh, I still doing the same things that I did in early and when I was in prison. Uh, I still do early morning. I do. Uh, I either uh, work out or do uh, yoga or meditation. So those are the things that really uh, empower my day. You know, I always like to uh, start, you know, on a good in a good note. So those are the things that really propel my my body and my spirit throughout the day. So I'm st I still do that as of today. Uh, so so I'm going to share with you. I know I, I probably don't have a lot of time. I'm going to give you a couple more, a couple minutes. So let me if you've used them, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line at tips and tools at smart recovery. And this is the last and tools for recovery that works. On today's show, we're gonna go through a really great tool called the VACI, or Vital Absorbing Creative Interest Exercise. It's a tool designed to help you think about new, helpful ways to find pleasure, fulfillment, or just simple contentment from activities that don't rely on your substance or addictive behaviors of choice, and ultimately aim to replace them. It's also a practical exercise to help you find ways to spend your time more wisely, as we say. Because as anyone in recovery knows, after you turn your back on your addictive behavior, you have a lot of new time on your hands. The challenge is finding ways to fill that time. Thanks to the VACI though, we can turn this challenge into an opportunity. All the new time you have in your life, free from addiction, can be put to use finding new hobbies or rekindling old passions in your life. Activities that made your life fun and meaningful before you got sidetracked by addiction. Activities from a more innocent, less complicated time. In a way, it's almost like, hey, you get to be a kid again. And how cool is that? So let's start the exercise and brainstorm up several vital absorbing creative interests, not just to fill the time, but to make the time fun and meaningful. And when I say meaningful, I mean meaningful to you. The best way to start is by coming up with VACIs that can replace the real or perceived benefits you derive from your addiction. Which benefits? Well, let's take a look back at the CBA or cost benefit analysis we filled out back in episode three of the series. Examples of benefits derived from your addictive behaviors might be less social anxiety, euphoria, feeling funnier, and feeling smarter, just to name some examples. Great, now let's list some healthful activities that might replace the benefits of the substances or behaviors that you were addicted to. Social situations cause you anxiety? Well, then find activities that don't require you to be on the spot socially, like meditation, walks on the beach by yourself, mountain biking, or reading. But let's say you need to go to a social occasion. Well, try looking up some of the guests on LinkedIn or Facebook before the event to get a preview of what they're into. Then introduce yourself and ask questions about their work. People love talking about themselves. Need some euphoria? Try skydiving, ride a roller coaster. If you have the money, take flying lessons. Try rock climbing, or just go to the gym and work out. Your brain will release dopamine and serotonin naturally, and you'll feel euphoric naturally. But listen, if you don't have the time or the money for these kinds of adrenaline-based activities, th that's not a problem either. Sedentary activities like reading, a thriller, or a murder mystery can also be exhilarating. There's also movies, audiobooks, YouTube videos, and podcasts. 
Want to feel funnier? Trust me. Chances are that when you were wasted, people weren't laughing with you, they were laughing at you. So turn this dynamic around and actually earn it. Try to actually be funnier for real. And you can do that by signing up for a comedy improv class, go to a comedy club, read a book about comedy or comedy theory, or sit down with a pad of paper and just write jokes. Want to feel smarter? Well, the easiest way to do that is to learn. So sign up for an online course, go back to school, join a book club, set up an RSS feed, listen to podcasts, read a few blogs, and then maybe write a few blogs. So now let's boil down these vital absorbing creative interests into a manageable to-do list of potential activities whose effects are more helpful substitutes to what you were used to doing. Add a column to the right of this list and rate how interested you are in these activities on a scale of one to 10 before you actually try them. Now, go try them. Then come back to your list, add another column, and rate that activity on a scale of one to 10 after you tried them. You may find that some of the VACIs that sounded awesome in principle and were at the top of your list before you tried them didn't captivate you enough for you to really want to repeat them. And you may also find that the VACIs that were at the bottom of your list end up being your new favorite hobbies. Whatever those are, do them again. They're obviously making you happy. And these new VACIs don't need to be over the top risky, amazing, super trendy, or even particularly fascinating. Remember, nobody's watching you. Nobody's judging you. This is about you. Do whatever works for you. Hey, I hope these smart recovery exercises really help. And if you've used them. Yeah, I, I'm a strong believer on if I say, you know, no to drugs. I, I needed to start saying yes to other things in my life that really, uh, you know, uh, get, made me happy. And it was funny because when I, uh, I, when I got clean up in state, I was working in a horse farm. And when I started my path uh, to manhood, uh, when I was in my teens, uh, that's what I was doing. I was, I was living in Puerto Rico, just taking care of, of horses and stuff like that. So when I recovered, it was amazing that I recovered right where I left off. So I started really reconnecting with that little boy that got trapped in all this crazy thing in the world. Uh, uh, but I was uh, in working with horses and stuff like that, really reconnected with me that. And that's what I'm at today. You know, I still love the outdoors and I still believe on finding those things that make us happy. Now I got the love and the trust of my family, my coworkers. So, you know, it's, it's a great feeling. So I, even before I left jail, I sent myself a, 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 a letter to my future self a year after. And I read and I was really crying because, you know, I was doing a lot better than expected. So with that, guys, I know this is smart in a nutshell. So I just going to open it up for any questions. Uh, I know it's, uh, I didn't have a lot of time, but you know, that is my pathway. I do believe uh, there's many pathways, whatever worked for you. So, so the question is, where are meetings? Uh, right now we have a meeting online. Uh, so if, uh, can I say, so? yeah. So if you send me, uh, let me send it right here. Jose Lugo at West Community Health Center dot org. If you send me a uh, an email there, uh, I would uh, I will send you a link. Is every Wednesday tomorrow from six to. Uh, 715 uh most of the time so and if you go online also on our recovery meetings you will find us there too so either way uh it will link back into uh that address so um jose i have a question um you had yeah. talked about writing and the importance of writing um can you share a little bit about what do you write and and why do you and why why that particular writing is important to you uh i write different <laughs> uh different things like uh okay when I, in the beginning at my beginning stages is a booklet 
uh, that we have in SMART is that it's those some of those questions that what, what do I want for my future, uh, what I'm doing about it right here, right now. Uh, SMART is really about uh, what's going on right here, right now. Uh, so when I when I wrote, I, I wrote a lot of things. I wrote about my, my, my what I'm doing now. I, I, I did a lot of affirmations. Like I did a lot of stuff in my uh, in my addiction. And one of the affirmations that I always use is that that's not who I am. That's who I become. Mm -hmm. I become that liar. I become that uh, thief that you know manipulator all those things mm -hmm. that are not me that's who i become that's not who i am mm -hmm. uh, i remember my brother my brother <laughs> my brother had a you know had a nice restaurant and uh and when he and he started drinking he became he used to get on top of the tables and be really becoming ridiculous but now that's not who he is that's who we become every time we drink. And I, and I know all you guys could see that in a lot of and people in our life and ourselves too. And so yeah. that's an example that I, I do write. And I think that writing, uh, it takes a life of its own. It's more ingrained. So I can't even explain it. A lot of these things, how they happen. Because to me, come on, Jose, you telling me you, it's like manifesting itself. Mm. Uh, so to a power greater than I could understand that I can't even explain to you. I'm not even going to go there, <laughs> but it just writing it down again, it, it, it just give you uh, more emphasis and more meaning to what you do. And I don't have to share it. I, I stuff that I don't share to nobody. It means oh, sure. you're writing. So, yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, there's a question from Robert. He says um, he's interested in leading a smart recovery and how can he do that? Is there a training that somebody must go through in order to be yeah. able to facilitate? Yeah, it's a training. Uh, it's, it's online through Smart2. It's like a, probably uh, before it was like a 12-week training uh, that you do uh, through Smart. If you go to uh, 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 smartrecovery.org, uh, and you say you want to become a facilitator, uh, it goes, you go through them right there. So they have all the information. Uh, it's pretty cool. I, I, I encourage everybody, you know, that, you know, like that type of path is a different path. Uh, you know, and the good thing is like, like we have meetings and we have people, uh, and a guys, you know, it doesn't really matter from Dharma. They use, okay, Jose, get, you know, they want to have different tools, mm -hmm. uh, different perspective. It doesn't really matter. We don't, we don't into uh, this one is better. That one, is, no, you know, uh, it's just adding more tools like anything else uh, mm -hmm. in life. So mm -hmm. again, uh, that's what we do. So in the traditional, I, you know, um, I, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, has helped me in my journey. Um, and in Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk about sponsorship, right? right? Um, having somebody um, that can help somebody through the steps. Does uh, Smart Recovery have uh, sponsors or me mentors or leaders? Is there, a, is there a terminology for that? If someone is new to Smart Recovery, say, and they come to you saying, I want to learn more about Smart Recovery, does that deem you as a a mentor or a sponsor? Is there any type of terminology no. for that? The, no. It's more emphasizes that we do have the power to make the choice either to use or not to use. Okay. Uh, and then uh, what it tells you is that, okay, these are the tools. What do you want to do? You know, uh, you, you go to the meetings and ask questions. Yes. Uh, you could go online also. In online, they have an abundance of information. They have tools. Uh, they have worksheets. Uh, they have chat rooms. So, you know, uh, we don't have what is called a sponsorship like mm -hmm. NAAA. What we do is a whole community. <laughs> so it, it, it doesn't really matter if you go 
to our meetings, uh, like tomorrow evening, or you go to online meetings with people from all over the world, it's the same principle, same uh, concept. Uh, uh, but yes, we don't we don't do the sponsorship again because the, the idea is to empower the individual. They say, listen, you know, you do have the choice not to use again. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, and these are the tools to get you there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does someone, um, you know, Robert asked about uh, being able to be a facilitator for smart recovery. What about somebody that's watching that just wants to go to a meeting? Um, and, and, you know, sometimes when you go to mutual aid supports, they want you to affirm yourself in that mutual aid support. Do you, is that smart recovery doesn't sound that way. So if I'm interested in attending a smart recovery, can I just go without necessarily having to introduce myself or label myself? How does that work? Right. We don't label ourselves because, uh, we, you know, sometimes labels take a life of their own. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, give me an example, when we go in the meeting, uh, we just check in. Okay, let's check in, guys. And and it's not mandatory, you know. How you going? How you guys doing since the last time we met? You know. And then uh, we pick an, an agenda. Okay, uh, all depends. All depends the check in. If a new a new person comes in, uh, we have a format. Uh, you know, we tell them a little bit about what we do, and if they want to share. Uh, you know where they were at, where they at today. Now what happened yesterday? Where they at today? What led them there? They could it's up to them, or they're just gonna sit in San Jose. I just want to hear and, and listen to that. That's it's your option. Uh, so uh, we uh, we do not identify, like I say, ourselves with uh, with labels. And then after we uh, do we pick up a topic? Uh, sometimes. Uh, it matter, you know, this week, uh, you know, I do a lot of groups, for the, it was reservations, you know, those reservations that sometimes we have, and, and in the NA book, it has it, you know, <laughs> reservations. So that's one of the topics we had just uh, today uh, anyway. And, and it was, you know, that's always is the elephant in the room, you know, like Jose, what are you talking about? I can never, ever have another drink, <laughs> you know? And we show the evidence, you know, the evidence shows that once you get, we got four different stages and the stages of consequences, dependency, you will not ever go back to stage one, which is just the casual user or uh, for coping. Once you get in stage three and four, you know, you could try, but the evidence, because we evidence based, it shows that listen, you're always going to have consequences or dependency, you know, if you keep using. Uh, and that was always been my problem that I always had reservations. Okay, I'm not gonna uh, use dope, so I'm gonna, uh, you know, back in the day was wine coolers. Let me have some wine coolers. But after drinking some wine coolers, that really wasn't my high. Uh, what the heck, you know, why not? Right. So, you know, it impairs my my decision making anyway. Any a drug, uh, a drug is a drug, an alcohol is a drug. So we do believe in, in complete abstinence. Mm -hmm. All that moderation does not work. Mm -hmm. Again, the evidence is. Uh, I know some guys say, Jose, I don't need no evidence. I know it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but. But yeah, we don't believe in moderation. We believe in in, in completely uh, 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 obstinate. Now, remember, uh, smart is only tailored for drug and alcohol. You got uh, sex addiction, eating mm -hmm. disorders. So with eating disorders, uh, there is moderation. So, you know, I know in the internet, uh, people say, oh, but smart believe in moderation. Well, it is true that we believe in moderation if it's eating disorders, you know, because you cannot abstain from eating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you read, it's, if it's drug and alcohol, complete abstinence. Uh, but if it's if it's eating, uh, uh, you know, food or uh, or or sex, uh, we believe in moderation in some aspects. So you know, when they, we hear that word moderation, 
you got okay can you elaborate a little bit more that you know they said okay it's about eating yes well yeah obviously it's moderation but yeah no. yeah and then another question came up um you know in aa and na they say that um we are fully self-supporting through our own contributions mm -hmm. is there a fee for smart recovery how do you um support yourselves and then is there a fee for the book because you mentioned about the smart recovery book so is there a fee for the book well that's a good question <laughs> let me say it at a traditional uh smart yes you have to uh either pay for your own book and you know it's called a pass of the hat they pass the hat around mm -hmm. to it to the location like the naaa uh, fortunately, Birch Community Health Center, your fine taxpayers' money will pay for your book <laughs> in the location. So, you know, uh, uh, when, when we started there, Birch Community Health Center said, Jose, tell me how many books we got. And we have in Spanish and in English. That's what I love about it. So they've been very supportive towards the program. Everybody that go there gets a book. Uh, either we have Spanish groups too on on Thursday, uh, but anyway, on Wednesdays, yes, you go in there. And we have a book for you, uh, free of charge, and we don't pass the hat again. Uh, when we started, it was right there at eight thirty Penn Street on Wednesday from six to like seven thirty. It was pretty cool. It was, it, it, we used to get a lot of people from all walks of life. We have people coming, uh, driving uh, forty five minutes to an hour. To come into my groups, to come into the to the groups of, of Smart, uh, again, it's Smart is not really a faith based approach mm -hmm. to uh, to treatment. Uh, it's more a cognitive, uh, evidence based approach uh, to uh, to recovery. Okay, great. Um, so we are um, at that time. We got about two minutes left. Is there anything that uh, we probably missed um, out, and that we just kind of want folks to know about Smart Recovery? Um, it does certainly sound like it's a growing pathway. Do you know when it started? Let me ask you that. Do you know when it about when did it start? Yeah, it started back in California by uh, Joe uh, and uh, two professors. Uh, and they was seeing that, uh, you know, a lot of people really wasn't embracing into, uh, uh and then, right. Mm -hmm. And then they, and, and then it came around, remember the MAT, the medical assistant treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So it was like in the nineties. So, you know, and then, so what they decided was like, okay, we're gonna do. Uh, they started uh, building that type of concept of, of smart recovery. So in the beginning, it was very slow, and then I was since uh, the introduction of MAT, it took a life of its own, and that's why, uh, like in Best Community Health Center, it embraces uh, those providers which are more medical. They incline more on the evidence-based approach, uh, embraces that type of concept because uh, uh, it's, it's non is non-faith-based. Uh, so that's when it started back in the day, and then evolved to where where we at now. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you. Being that wealth of information regarding smart recovery, and, and we knew that. This was really important uh, for Berks County and as people go forward and they get well, that we really, Berks County is really robust uh, in recovery. And more importantly, we're really robust in various pathways to recovery. So we are uh, thankful for you, Jose, and for your knowledge. And um, thank you for uh, coming on and sharing this information with us. Um, I'm gonna ask those that are out there in Facebook land um, that we're going to continue the series in terms of our speaker uh, out loud series. And so asking you if there's other pathways that you are interested in, if there's other uh, things that we should talk about in terms of, of recovery and beyond, because as Jose mentioned and 
all the other speakers mentioned that now comes the living part. Now comes the living part without use of substances. And how do we do that? How do we go on to live beyond well? Uh, we can bring those topics into your living room and at your home uh, in a safe way uh, during this time. Also, want to remind folks that if you're interested in our Recovery Out Loud t-shirt, I happen to have mine here holding it up. Yeah. So it like. uh, you just need to send me uh, your, send to me at ystroman at Coca Burks, your name and your size, because I know many of you have been returners each week to uh, check us out. And so we're really appreciative for you. We couldn't do this if you weren't where you were. So uh, we want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And look to our uh, BerksRise.org uh, for more information about our ongoing speaker series. And uh, be safe tonight. Be well. And more importantly, stay sober. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.